this privilege to be here today. We are so thankful that we're actually able to be here in person this time um, because I think it's been several years, at least four, five maybe, until we've actually been here in person. And um, so last time, like Pastor said, we did a uh, Zoom update and that, that's just not the same, right? Um, but uh, we uh, realized that it's really not terribly far to uh, just drive down here. And uh, so we thought, you know, hey, let's do it. And uh, we're so glad that we were able to actually uh, make it. It was a surprise for our kids, actually, because um, they didn't know until basically the last minute or a week or so before that we were coming down because we didn't want to get their, their hopes up or anything. But um, thank you so much um, for your prayers, for your support. You truly have been one of the churches that has supported us right from the beginning. And uh, we are so thankful for you and um, excited about what the Lord is doing here at Bethel as well. And so uh, just a little bit of uh, update on Gracie. Pastor was uh, asking me if I would just say a few words about where she is right now. So Gracie is our oldest. And uh, last year, uh, around December, I believe it was, she, um, she left Toronto and moved back to Maine, uh, Maine, northern Maine, where my parents are and where most of my family are. And so she actually lives when she's in Maine with my parents. Uh, she worked with them for a time, and then she got her own job at a different place. Now she's working as a uh, CNA, a Certified Nurses Assistant, in a nursing facility. But currently, she is in Mount Morris, New York, which is uh, close to Rochester, and she is at uh, Lamplighter um, Theater. Lamplighter is a ministry that does uh, Christian radio dramas. They also um, they also make uh, books, and so at their headquarters, they have a book bindery. They have a place where they record all their radio dramas and everything. So they call it the the uh, Master's Guild. So Gracie is there right now. We dropped her off uh, in September to uh, to Lamplighter. And uh, so she's only going to be there for three months. That's how long. It's like an internship or an apprenticeship. So she'll be there for three months. And then she'll head back up to northern Maine and be with my parents and my family again. But she'll be working as a CNA at the nursing facility. Um and uh, then we will be traveling to Maine as well in December for a couple weeks so that we can update uh, some of our churches up there. So um, things are going great. We're really enjoying our time uh, in Toronto. We've been there for almost, as I said, three years. And um, the ministry is really, um, really exciting. And uh, it's just exciting to be in Toronto in the first place because, as you know, it took us several years to get there. And uh, now it's hard to believe that the Lord has allowed us to be there for uh, three years already. Um, so I'd like to, uh, this afternoon, just kind of give you a, a, a video update, a PowerPoint presentation, uh, showing you some pictures and what God has actually been doing in Toronto. If you have your Bible, I'd like for you to turn to Philippians once again, Philippians chapter 1, Philippians chapter 1, and this morning I want to talk about the blessings of suffering, the blessings of suffering. I want you to think of this as we begin that God brings blessings out of suffering. And Philippians is actually a book that deals with a lot of suffering. The context is that the Apostle Paul, at the end of the book of Acts, he was imprisoned because, well, first of all, he went to Jerusalem and he went into the temple and he had a Gentile with him. Uh, not at that moment, but he was accused as having br brought in a Gentile into the temple because he had been seen with a Gentile before, and the Jews didn't like Paul anyways, and they were trying to ruin the ministry of the gospel among him. 
and they accused him and he was arrested. And then, you know, as the end of Acts goes, Paul, he eventually um, made his way, uh, not necessarily because he wanted it to be this way, but he made his way to Rome before Nero. And this seems to be where Paul is in the book of Philippians. It's been about 10 years or so since Paul had seen the believers in Philippi. And you might say that Philippians is almost like a thank you note or a missionary update that Paul gives to the church of Philippi because they hadn't heard from him for a very long time. And they had sent to Paul Epaphroditus with a gift while Paul was in prison. And um, Epaphroditus himself got sick while he was visiting Paul. And um, so Epaphroditus um, eventually would go back and explain to the church what God had been doing in the life of the Apostle Paul, even in the midst of his suffering. I want you to think of these words that only God can take a bad situation and turn it into a good situation. Only God can take the suffering that you and I face and turn it into a glorious thing. Only he can take our suffering and make it good. In this case, Paul said elsewhere in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, that he was bound, but the word of God was not bound. And in fact, the gospel is actually flourishing. And Paul, in the book of Philippians here, he had quite a successful uh, gospel ministry, a successful prison ministry, actually. Remember, he was under house arrest, and he was chained to a Roman centurion for, you know, 24-7, and what do you think that Roman centurion heard on a regular basis? He heard the gospel. And it's amazing because you would think that during a time of a believer's darkest hours of suffering, that all would in fact be lost, but that wasn't the case. The gospel would not be silenced. God was working and the church was not discouraged but was actually greatly encouraged. You know, the opposite of uh, discouragement has proven true for Christians, that during persecution, it's often during those times that God does his greatest work. Tertullian once said that it's the blood of the martyrs which is seed. In other words, believers may suffer, but God brings great blessings out of that suffering. In Philippians chapter 1, we see this in verses 12 through 18, that Paul, though he is suffering in prison, God is producing so many wonderful blessings as a result of his suffering. And in this text, I want us to see what you might call three blessings of Paul's suffering, or three uh, fruits or results of his suffering. And I want us to understand that these are also fruits and blessings that God will provide for you and I as well. Now, I don't, I don't know in your life right now where things are. I don't know if you're going through trials presently. But James chapter 1 tells us that it's not a matter of if trials will come. It's a matter of when. We have to be prepared. But listen, friends, the, the beauty is that even as we do face these trials, even as we do go through times of suffering, and we will, we will, there are great blessings that God will produce in our suffering. In verses 12 to 13, I want us to see the first blessed fruit of suffering, and that is that when we suffer, God advances the gospel in ways that we could never imagine. 
Verse 12 says, but I would you should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. The key word here is furtherance. In other words, the gospel had not stalled. The gospel, in fact, was progressing. It was furthering. The ministry of the gospel was actually going forward. And God was greatly blessing this ministry that Paul had even while in prison. He explains in Philippians here that the gospel was advancing. This word here literally means to, to progress or to cut forward, you might say. It was a word that was used for soldiers that needed to cut a path. You remember in history that in the Battle of Philippi, that is precisely what happened. You had uh, Mark Antony and you had uh, Brutus opposing armies that had to cut a path through this swamp, in essence, to get to each other. And often this cutting forward or this cutting path was something that was done amongst enemies. So years ago, when I was, I think it was a summer, summertime, um, I worked a job during the summer as um, a land surveying assistant. So the land surveyors, they're, they're the guys that get out there and, you know, they measure the boundary lines of a property. And they do that by way of a person like myself holding a pole with a prism on top. And he has this um, instrument with a laser beam that bounces off that prism. You, you've seen them do that in road work before. And, um, but the thing about um, this particular job that I was uh, involved with is that there were times that we would go out into the field and go to work. And uh, my boss would say to me, well, guess what? We're going up to uh, Portage Lake today. And I'm like, cool, that's great. Portage Lake. This should be pretty easy. And we get there. And I noticed that uh, here's Portage Lake in front of me. Well, here's this dense forest right next to it. And uh, my boss says, so we're going to have to cut a path today in order to get the proper measurements. So we have to cut a big, long line and it's going to be through the woods so a good part of our our job was to take myself a machete and he had a chainsaw and we would just cut a path and it would take hours upon hours to make a straight line so that he could measure the boundary lines now i can't say in my case that as we were cutting through the foliage that there were enemies lurking nearby, like uh, Brutus and Mark Antony. I think the enemies mostly were probably hornets and, and uh, thorns and things like that. But the idea was to cut away the, the trees and the small bushes and things so that we could make a, a straight line. And that is exactly what this word progress means. Paul, when it came to the gospel, says that... Actually, what has happened is that the gospel has been progressing. And not only has it been progressing, but so far has it been progressing. And in verse 13, he says, so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. And again, you think about that. Paul, he's... He's arrested, but here all of Caesar's household has heard the gospel. This is a this is a beautiful truth that even though Paul is is suffering, God is advancing the gospel. And dear friends, God will advance the gospel in your suffering too. Years ago, also, I was at a pastor's conference, and one particular pastor was not able to come. 
because he had cancer and he was just too weak. So what he did is he recorded a, an update, basically, and uh, we were shown the update at the conference. And here he is on a TV screen, his hair falling out, looked emaciated, looked, looked like he was very thin. And here he was telling us, a pastor, telling us, guys, I just want to say, that I have had so many opportunities to share the gospel with people. Now that I have cancer, more so than I did when I was healthy and just a healthy pastor. Why? Because when I go to my treatments, people will ask me, there's something different about you. There's peace. What is it? Why are you not scared like we are? And he would explain to them because of Jesus. And he would share the gospel with them. And friends, that's what, that's what you and I have the privilege of when we suffer. Is that when we suffer, God often advances the gospel in ways that we could never imagine. In ways that you could never dream. I mean, do you think that Paul, um, as he was under house arrest, could have, could imagine that the whole palace, the whole Praetorian Guard, all of Caesar's household would have heard the gospel and no doubt many come to faith? Who knows what was going through Paul's mind at first? But God certainly had a plan for him. And God will use you and I as well. What's the second blessing? of suffering. A second blessing and fruit or result is found in verse 14, that when we suffer, believers are greatly encouraged to trust God more. Verse 14 says, and many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds. That's right are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Believers are greatly encouraged as a result of Paul's suffering. They didn't know how he was doing. But he said, you know what, guys? The truth is that the believers are encouraged even more to proclaim the gospel because of my imprisonment, because of my bonds. You know, sometimes God allows you and I to suffer so that we might be used to encourage other brothers and sisters. Sometimes he allows us to go through a particular trial because he's going to use the encouragement and help and grace that we receive from him to, to show that same grace and encourage another brother or sister down the road. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 to 5. This is what Paul explains in verse 3, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. He says, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation. Why? Here's the reason that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. The Philippians, in Paul's case here, there were some that were boldly proclaiming the gospel because they loved Paul. Notice what he says in verse 15 of our text. Some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife, and some also of good will. So while Paul's in prison, you have these, these street preachers, if you will, that are out there proclaiming the gospel, but for wrong motives. 
And then you had others who were proclaiming the gospel for right motives because they love Paul and they support him. And Paul, whether these ones who were preaching for wrong reasons or those who loved him, we see his attitude, and that's actually the third result or fruit of our suffering, is that when we suffer, God transforms our hearts. And I say that because Paul says in verse 6, 16, the one preached Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds, but the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. But what is Paul's response in verse 18? He says, what then? Notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And I therein do rejoice. Yea, and I will rejoice. Now he goes on and and, and the passage goes on, the paragraph goes on. If you know Paul, he didn't write short sentences. Often it was 15, 16 verses until he came to a period. His arguments are, you have to follow them very carefully. But we'll stop there for our purposes. But when we suffer, God transforms our hearts. Paul could have been bitter. He could have been angry at, wait a second, these guys who are proclaiming the gospel out of wrong motives, he could have been angry with that. And he could have been bitter. But that wasn't, the, that wasn't his attitude. It was, no matter what, I am going to rejoice. And I say that when we suffer, God transforms our hearts. I believe God transformed Paul's heart. It's not our normal reaction. Our, our default, even as Christians, is, is the flesh. And we need to continually ask the Lord for strength and continually depend on, on him. Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. And, you know, in my own life, I, I had something happen last year, actually, at summertime, um, that caused me to understand, truly, without Jesus, I can do nothing. I can't even get out of bed without Jesus. I can't even move my fingers. I can't even see or blink or or anything he is truly as colossians 1 16 and 17 says in him all things consist in him all things are held together and that, that isn't just a nice little phrase well um without me you can do nothing and 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 you know we we say that give lip service to it but but folks do you really truly believe that Without him, you can't do anything. And he brought me to that point last year. And I, I had to be bedridden for uh, several days and was wondering, am, am I getting out of bed? Am I going to recover from, from this, this uh, situation? It was pretty scary, actually. But it helped me to understand Without you, Lord, I, I can't do anything. If you want me to be in bed the rest of my life, or if you want me to, you know, not be able to do the same type of uh, ministry, that's okay. The same amount of ministry, you want me to tone it back a little bit, that, that's okay. Things were possibly going to be different, but thankfully God did give me strength again. But it was him. It was him. He gave me the strength. We have to truly believe that and not just give lip service to it. And Paul, 
this was not his natural default. It was the spirit of God working within him to transform his heart, to come to that place where he could say, yes, I rejoice. I rejoice and I'm going to rejoice. And it's funny because he, he actually says almost, if you didn't hear me right the first time, I'm going to say it again. I will rejoice. And then he says later in Philippians, rejoice in the Lord. He was full of rejoicing and, and uh, joy. When we suffer, when we suffer, God advances the gospel in ways that we could never imagine. And when we suffer, believers are more encouraged. And, and and maybe you'll have one of those opportunities coming up where you'll be able to encourage another brother, another sister. But when we suffer, God transforms our hearts. Our suffering isn't done in a vacuum. God doesn't allow us to suffer for, for no reason. Romans chapter 8, 28 says, all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. And then 29 explains to us what that purpose is, and that's Christ-likeness. It's a process that each of us are going through right now where we are becoming more like Christ. Job experienced this transformation in his life, didn't he? There was a period in Job's life where, you know, he was doing pretty well, worshiping the Lord, and then all of a sudden his friends show up and, they, they start to accuse him and tell him things about himself that weren't even true. And Job started to become bitter. And in the end, in Job chapter 42, Job says, I've heard of you. Now my eye sees you and I repent in dust and ashes. God transformed Job's heart as well. Only God can turn a bad situation into a good one. Only he was able to give Paul and Silas joy as they were singing in, in jail. And the Philippian jailer eventually asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Only God can advance, advance the gospel in times of suffering. And only God can use us to encourage others to trust him more and more. And only God can transform us in our times of suffering. So let's entrust our souls and our suffering to our faithful God.